That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about Fem, the directorial debut of Sam H. Freeman and Eng Chun Ping, which premiered at the 2023 Berlin International Film Festival. It is being released courtesy of Utopia on March 22nd, 2024. Directorial debut. Mm -hmm. From uh, they had an earlier short film from 2021 called Femme. Uh, I think that there were some slight differences with obviously, but yeah. What is Femme about? It follows Jules, who is targeted in a horrific homophobic attack, destroying his life and career. Sometime after that event, he encounters Preston, one of his attackers, in a gay sauna. He wants revenge. That's pretty interesting. Uh, what's your pull quote? An effectively agonizing psychological revenge thriller, the film subversively intersects race, gender, and the toxic, intrinsic conditioning of self-loathing in the queer community, which is navigated quite impressively by its two lead performances. Mine. Fantastic lead performances and timely subject matter make Femme a riveting watch. Yeah, I thought this movie was excellent. Mm -hmm. The story is pretty simple. There's this guy named Jules, played by... Uh, Nathan Stewart Jarrett of 2021's Candyman. And Nathan, oh, sorry, <laughs> Jules performs as a drag queen named Aphrodite. Mm -hmm. And the opening of the film is Aphrodite performing. Prior to her entering the club, Jules spots this guy whose name he doesn't know, but it's Preston, played by... George McKay. Kind of checking him out. Loitering outside. Like loitering outside the gay bar. So... Aphrodite performs, leaves the club, it appears to have been a good night, goes to a convenience store to buy cigarettes, and guess who's there? Preston and his raggedy friends. And in drag. And Jules is still in drag as Aphrodite, yeah. So Preston and his friends are harassing Jules. And Jules chose not to be the bigger person that day and sort of antagonizes Preston in mm -hmm. front of his friends, saying like, it's funny you wanna call me the F slur, because earlier tonight you were checking me out. But unfortunately for you, you're not my type. And of course they all go crazy. They chase Aphrodite out of the convenience store, convenience store. And Preston beats Jules up while his friends are recording it. So we see three months later, Jules is obviously dealing with the trauma of that night and doesn't want to go out, doesn't want to perform. But one day ends up at a like a bathhouse, like a, like where men go to have sex, and sees Preston there. And Preston's acting a fool at the bathhouse. Mm -hmm. He's mad that some guy's trying to hit up on him or push up on him. But while they're both at the lot like in the locker room, Preston hits on Jules. Mm -hmm. So then they begin like a sexual relationship, like a very NSA situation. But during that time, Jules, I would say, has kind of become like obsessed with this idea of revenge porn. Specifically, we see Jules looking up, like exposing straight guy videos. Mm -hmm. So as the audience, it's clear that this is what Jules wants to do. And everything culminates in a night where Jules is supposed to go to Preston's house. Because it starts off very NSA, but then they start to connect and Preston has gotten to the point where he's comfortable with Jules coming over. Mm -hmm. But Jules lives with his raggedy ass friends. So one night, Jules is headed over there. And when he gets in the elevator, so do Preston's friends. So he's texting him like, girl, your friends are about to come into the apartment. So Jules kind of decides to... It's also important to know Jules has been butching it up. Mm -hmm. Because Preston doesn't like that he dresses kind of gay. So... Preston, or Jules kind of passes this straight. So on this night, Jules is at the apartment with all of Preston's friends playing Street Fighter. And the friends take a liking to Jules. And they all go out. And that's where he learns that Preston is definitely not at the top of his hierarchy. No. In this world. In fact, they kind of treat Preston like a joke. Because the leader of the friend group says, yeah, we like to antagonize Preston because he, like, he has anger management issues. Mm -hmm. But they all go out that night because they're having a gay old time. And Jules decides that he wants to be the more dominant role. Because up till then, Preston's very aggressive with Jules sexually, like come and go type situations. But on this night, Jules is like, I want to dominate you. Well, it's interesting that that happens because Preston is already acting in a submissive way. Yes. 
amongst the alpha of his pack. Right. And Jules, I think, picks up on that and as he starts to dig, finds that Preston responds accordingly. Yeah, we should talk about that again because that's a very interesting scene. But part of this new uh, dynamic is Jules is like, I'm going to record us. Jules tried earlier in the film and Preston got so mad, threw his mm -hmm. phone away. But this time, Preston's like, okay. So they make like a full-on sex tape. But this is where things go left because the next morning, Preston meets Jules' friends, this guy and girl who he lives with. And on the side, Jules' best friend invites Preston. Toby. Ratchet, to little Ratchet Toby. Mm-hmm. I thought Toby was a good friend, but kind of stupid, because, mm. like, why would you do this? He was, he had his own personal, uh... You problems. were more bothered by him than I was. Yeah. I interpreted him more as, like, just being a caring friend mm. who probably likes his friend. He did, but he was, he also acted very selfishly. Uh, I mean, I'm assuming they're in their 20s, and... Mm -hmm. I, but either way, I think it was a well-done character. But this little friend invites Preston to Jules' birthday party, which also happens to be Jules' like return as Aphrodite. I also didn't mention throughout the entire film, Preston does not recognize Jules as the person he assaulted three months prior. So poor Preston, well, poor Preston. Preston shows up to the birthday party with a gift, not knowing that the person he's been seeing is a drag queen. Mm -hmm. And then when Jules gets on stage as Aphrodite, you can see on Preston's face that it's like, oh my God, that's the person I assaulted. But also... Jules dumbass as Preston gets on the mic and is like, hey y'all, it's good to be back again. You know, I got gay bashed, but guess what? That fool who attacked me, I recorded myself having sex with him. So I'm gonna post this revenge porn. <laughs> so of course Preston is like raging mad. They have an altercation in like a dressing room. And then the final scene of the film is them in an alley fighting, almost to the point where we think Preston's gonna kill Jules. But they stop. Jewel says, I feel I feel sorry for you. Mm -hmm. And then the film ends. So we don't know if Jules... Because we get a scene where Jules may publish the video. Like, he's on the gay porn or the porn site ready to upload it. And we see that his cursor is above, like, publish. And then he closes the laptop. So we don't know what he did. And then we also don't know if they're going to continue to see each other. Yeah, because that's what's so effed up about it is they have... They have an attraction to one another yeah. too. So I think the the psychological warfare that is going on and it what is a simple uh, revenge narrative is really compelling. And it's pretty complex when you break down the way these two characters are developed. Um, the role playing and code switching. Uh, I mean, the stakes are quite high. Well, let's talk about that. So Jules is seems because we don't know a lot about Jules' background, and I think that that makes sense because Jules just presents as like a confident queer person comfortable in their skin yeah. they do drag so I, I think as audience we kind of get a sense of who this person is but when the attack happens and he loses that confidence and gains more fear and starts seeing preston that's when the code switching starts because he gets the sense that preston likes him to be more masculine and he really falls into that in an effective way mm -hmm. and his friends start to notice and they don't like it because his best friend toby is you know but but that's that's interesting between these two white men this black queer character um they're they're both not liking the way he acts he has to change who he is being around them he has to act a certain role right, right? which i think is what really was bothering me about the toby character and what what which is why i think the filmmakers made this white queer person his uh cohort instead of like a having a, a black queer character to commiserate with i don't know though because I don't know that I agree with that because we just reviewed a film about a, a, a Middle Eastern drag queen. Layla. And Layla had, like all of her friends were people of color and they were acting the same. Like they were really trying to hold her to the image they had of her and what they expected of her. I sure, I just... I, I understand your critique. It does make sense to me, but I think that this little white gay friend also made sense. I, it does, because, and I think the optics of it are make for a really interesting isolating factor for Jules. Well, I think that's the key word is I think if, if, if we were to get a subsequent story about Jules, we might find that I think Jules lies somewhere in the middle, mm -hmm. but he feels trapped within his own friend group about having to be this overtly queer person who is not allowed to sort of be a chameleon and morph. And 
I don't know. I, I think there could be a really interesting conversation about that. Like, what's wrong with Jules sort of adjusting himself to fit more into Preston, right. someone he likes? Well, because if you know, right before Aphrodite performs, there are sanctions, right? Because she kisses Toby and everybody's like, what are you doing? He's your friend. It's like, well, right. can everybody define their relationships the way they want? Then you have Preston, who is, I mean, he. I think he's the most interesting character because, you know, even to say that Jules was gay bashed is like, well, I mean, another gay person, albeit closeted gay person, attacked him. And it wasn't just a random assault. It was like, yes, this per there's no excuse for what happened to Jules. Right. But Jules was antagonizing this person who, who they didn't know and didn't realize that they're also causing them. Jules was putting Preston in danger by saying what he said. Because we didn't know his background with his friends and that his friends kind of think he's a joke. And maybe they suspect that he's a little fruity. I don't know. Right. But I, that goes, that's, you never know where anybody is in no, their life. No, of course not. But at the same time, it's like, you can see Jules, uh, like how many of us have been in a convenience store where some asshole has said something and in retrospect, you're like, God, I wish I had said that. So oh, you, yeah. you can see, because there, there's a pause. He's ordering the cigarettes and that's when he turns around and retorts. And it's like, that's his moment where he's like, oh, I'm reclaiming yeah. this space. Like, F you. I, I mean, I'm, I don't blame Jules for doing that. Of course, it's like, well, that's why you got into a fight because you said the shit. But, sure. But, but also, there is no excuse for Preston assaulting Jules. But that's what I think is so interesting about the story is that it does feel complex because as we start to learn more about Preston, I sort of felt bad for him and I think he needed someone to help him be comfortable. And then... I was surprised that Jules acted the way he did because Jules, who I'm, my impression of Jules' character, like this character, is that he is comfortable in his skin and as a drag queen has sort of assumed the role of someone who is outspoken and does fight for the community. So I was surprised that Jules chose to make revenge porn instead of, because my first thought would be, oh, this character would be like, I know who assaulted me. I know their name. I know what they look like. I know their social media. I'm going to start... If the police won't do anything, I'm going to print pictures and post it everywhere. But I, but I think that's what's also so uncomfortable about this is because um, people, I think, when this premiered in Berlin, were unhappy with it because you also are seeing a black queer person doing something negative and toxic, like like a white woman, like Rebecca De Mornay in The Hand That Rocks the Cradle. I'm going to get back at you for causing my husband's suicide. Well, that's too bad because I think that's what makes this story so interesting. I agree. Is that both characters are kind of go in a direction that you wouldn't expect. And so then it's like, so then does that mean... Because, you know, it's like two wrongs don't make a right but in this situation I, at the end of the film I was kind of like oh I bet these two would make a good couple well, because <laughs> and that's what's so good about the story because Preston is also starting to change because yeah. of jewels in his life he's starting to make comments about how the flatmates he lives with are, are dumb and he's recognizing a he's, lot of yeah. he's recognizing that he could have a different life yeah uh, but at the same time revenge uh, starts to you know that's why they say it's a dish, a dish best served cold because you know, once you start humanizing right. your your who you are trying to lash out at, it becomes more difficult. Yeah, uh, I'm just gonna go through my notes. I thought that this like this is a really effective thriller because I was tense from the moment the film started, mm -hmm. knowing that there was an attack looming mm -hmm. very ra rapidly, and then knowing that Jules like like not knowing what Jules is going to do, and it was very effective in that way. Um, there is a mo during the attack, the friends are recording the attack and then nothing comes of that. That was something I wish we would have gotten back to, like maybe the friends sort of bring it up later or like that they didn't look at the video and not put two and two together that these these two people are... Sure. In retrospect, though, it mirrors what uh, Jules also does sure. in the video, an unused video. <laughs> yeah. The first time Preston and Jules have sex in his apartment, it's, it's a little... They don't know each other that well, so it's a little like, oh, why, why'd you even bring this person here? And then while they're, literally while Preston is inside of Jules, the friends come home. Mm -hmm. Which, you know, I, I've been in that situation and it just felt so stressful and I, I thought that was so well done. And then Pre Jules doesn't follow instructions because Preston tells his ass, just stay here and be quiet. But Jules is like, nah, I'm going to take some of your clothes because Jules was dressed all extra gay. So he takes some of Preston's clothes and walks out of the room and sees the friends and they're like, who the hell is this? And that's when they pretend that they were in jail together and that Jules was just there to buy drugs. Uh -huh. And the friends buy it, mm -hmm. which, again, was very well done because I also bought it, but I was so stressed out. 
But there's still underlying gay jokes in there. Like, oh, were you uh, his cellmate? Did you do things right. together? But typical what yeah. stupid dudes would say, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, oh, gosh. <laughs> Preston, I thought, was cute in the way that I felt bad for him, too. Like, pretending to be, like... A thug. A th like, all th I mean, yeah, it was very... That movie Havoc we reviewed on our Patreon. Mm -hmm. No, the podcast. With Anne Hathaway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's very that, but also, like, when they're having sex, and he's like, yeah, you want a big man. Girl, Jules is bigger than you, fool. Like, calm down. But I thought the way he saw himself was very interesting. It's interesting, because George McKay is usually... <laughs> This is not in a way that I think anybody's used to having seen him before and films, well, you know, even though, even 1917. Because um, there's usually kind of a sweetness to him that I, it's still kind of apparent, but it, it's kind of hard watching him be so raggedy. Yeah. But like, I, he grew on me as the film went on. Sure. Jules, the, the, the building he lives in with his two friends is huge. It made me think of that old restaurant in WeHo, French Quarter Market. Yeah. Like, well, how like many God, you how much like... money do y'all make? What? Well, and also, what were you doing for that three months right. that you weren't working? But, yeah. Um, yeah. There's a kind of a cr creepy, ironic line towards the end, because as Preston and Jules are more intimate and they're lying in bed looking at each other, Preston asks Jules about the scar on his head. And he's like, oh, someone attacked me. And Preston goes, give me their name. I'll F them up. And it's like, fool, it was you. It was you. You don't recognize? <laughs> I mean, Jules in drag was stunning. I mean, you know, didn't pad or cinch. So well, it was like, very early Shea Coulee. Yeah, but drag. you know, beautiful face, and the mm -hmm. hair was not that different because the hair was braided, but long, but but longer. So I mean, it's one of those things where it's like, how did she not know that Clark Kent was Superman? But okay. <laughs> well, the, it's more than just glasses, and people also sure. see what they want to see. That's true. That's true. Um, I got a little teary-eyed at the end because after Preston realizes Jules basically was setting him up and that maybe all the feelings he had weren't real, and he brought Jules a gift. At the end of the film, we see Jules open the gift, and it's a sweatshirt that... It's the sweatshirt that Jules took the first night he went to Preston's apartment, but then Preston's like, oh, well, that's a knockoff. That's also the uh, sweater he was wearing when he attacked Jules. That's right. Mm -hmm. So... The, the 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 note says like basically like happy birthday this sweatshirt is the real one like not a knockoff and i just thought like oh i i, I think that's excellent because it the, is at the end they're both revealed to each other to be this is the real deal of both of them yeah in, the, in this tussle in the alleyway and it's like yeah i don't you know i don't know that we i mean we don't need a sequel to this movie but i want to believe that maybe they reconnected in a way that was less toxic you would like to think so, but I, I don't know if there's the, the, the trauma that both of them uh, have gone through in the scenario. Is... I was very impressed with this movie. Uh, I liked how it looked. For a debut. You know, yeah. I, I think my response to it was also that it was reminding me of something like Paul Verhoeven's L, where Isabella Pair's rape victim is trying to turn the tables and usurp control uh, over, ha you know, once having lost it on her perpetrator. Like, I, I think those are, you know, fascinating ways care characters that are, are trying to regain what was lost if these filmmakers uh when they do something else i'd be happy to watch it oh for sure what would you give fem uh four i thought it was excellent i would give it four out of five anything else no join us on patreon and listen to our podcast bye <laughs>